This is for free. This week, uh, Chris and I have decided that we have a new mantra to live by, and I wanted to share it with you and see whether it's something you want to take in. And that is, we've decided to look for beauty and express gratitude. I'm thinking of having t-shirts made, you know, could, could work out, you know, look for beauty and express gratitude. Just thought, thought I'd share that with you. Because this week we have seen the beauty that God has provided in this valley uh, in abundance when we've paid attention. Uh, and so we've decided, first of all, we need to express gratitude by telling him about it and thanking him for all the things that he has given us that are so beautiful around us. This is the time of the year when, when people want to live in Southern California. Amen? Uh, I don't know, I'm new, but I know the rest of you are saying, oh good, it's not so hot. Well, not too quick. Um, this next week is supposed to be hot again. But that's okay, that's okay. The cool night comes and gives us relief, does it not? And we're, we're grateful for all of this, and we, and we thank our Heavenly Father. This month, we have been uh, going forward with a, a very interesting take on uh, what God does to shape us. And so we've called it Shaped by God, and the first weekend we talked about divine guidance and how God leads and guides us, and this is one of his shaping tools. The second weekend we talked about peril. It's a, a word we don't use very often. It's kind of an old King James word. You are in peril. We don't say that to each other. We say you are in danger. You are in trouble. That's what we say now. But peril is a nice old word that I decided to use. On the third Sabbath, I want to thank uh, uh, Brother uh, Jeff for being with us last week and talking about patience and how God gives us opportunity to develop patience in our lives. And so today we come to a word that may be a little more misunderstood, but it is still a tool I believe that God uses to shape us into the people that, that can be sharp in the doing of his work in this world right now. And that word is suffering. And you thought, oh, goodness gracious. Maybe he thought that because it's communion and we're going to be talking about the suffering of Jesus, that we should talk about suffering today. But it is one of those tools. And as was so nicely read just now, we saw a picture, I hope you had in your mind, I know I had in my mind, a picture of Jesus before the Sanhedrin. Jesus is there, he is, he is being questioned, and in fact, uh, the, the intent of the questioning is to find reason to justify what they had already decided to do. Now they knew that the law required that there be witnesses and that those witnesses had to agree. So if you were listening just a moment ago, or if you want a quick read back again, pull that pew Bible out if you don't have it, or get your phone out and you will see that the witnesses couldn't even agree. So it was very obvious to all present that like the children's story, thank you Jason, that was awesome, there was a lot of lying going on. They were lying about what Jesus had said. They were taking his words and twisting them. They were lying. But I want us to step back for a moment and, and just look at the word suffering, because I do believe that it is very misunderstood and that as God has pulled me along in life, uh, and, and, and I've had the opportunity to, to see what he does and, and how he does it, I, I want us to, to realize that there are two, two pieces that we need to understand about the word suffering. Number one is the experience. Suffering, we often think about, is, is an experience. And, and there are 
numerous pictures that you can think of in your mind or that you could look at on the internet of people who are in situations where they are suffering. And so when, when I say the word suffering to you, uh, you, you could probably easily tell me what that looks like in your own mind because what comes to mind is a picture of something where somebody is going through an experience that is painful. Okay? So that's the first part. Second part is this. It's a verb. The verb, to suffer. It's Old English. Now I'm going to quote the King James for a moment, since the King James is Older English. Finish the sentence for me. Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. Now why would the King James use the word suffer in this context? We could say that a synonym for the word suffer in this context is allow. Tell them it's okay. And in fact, the other half of the sentence, you could use the word allow again, or you could, you could also use the word suffer. You could say, allow the children to come, don't disallow them. Suffer the little children to come, don't keep them away, allow them to come. Put up with How's that? Can that be something that, that, that you understand goes together with the word suffering? You are putting up with, you are allowing, you are putting up with, this is part of what we think of when we, we think of the word suffer. We, we usually have negative feelings about this and this is what I have struggled with and and so this is why I'm happy to tell you today that we can possibly add some positive ideas to the word suffering by saying that it could simply mean pathway this is where I need to go suffer the little let the children come this way please Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane a, a, a few hours before our text that we read here in Mark this morning, and we see pictures of him bent over double. We see pictures that have been drawn of beads of blood, bloody sweat, capillaries that have burst because of the, the, the strain that he is under, the, the pain that he is in. What is he doing at that moment, my friends? He's talking to his father. Yes, he's praying. But he is struggling. Okay, this is, this is the tension that is happening. He is struggling because he has been given a journey. He has been given a path. The old English... Again, King James. Father, let this cup pass from me. The cup is a symbol of the journey that God had sent him on to be the savior of the world. And now it has come to this where his friends are going to desert him, where the people who are in the church the very hierarchy of the church are going to try to kill him. And he knows that this is coming, and he knows that this is the way that God has said that it would be, and he is saying, God, is there any other way that we can do this? Is there any pathway that doesn't have to go this way? Can I go another way? And, and that pathway idea is the word to me, suffering. Can I please do this another way? God says, no. 
but I'm going to send you angels to support you and to minister to you and give you the strength to walk the pathway that I am asking you to walk. I don't know about you, but I've had those times in my life where I didn't want to go where God was leading me. I didn't want to happen to me. I didn't want the experience that God was obviously outlining was going to be my experience. When your father is dying or when your friend is hurt uh, or, 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 you know, when you have terrible big time exams coming and you're thinking, oh, please, 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 can I just not have to do this? We come to that same point. And I want you to know that I, I have to use a word right here that none of us like. Jesus submitted. He says those words that we need to also say. Not my will, but thy will be done. If this is the cup that I am supposed to drink, if this is the life that I am supposed to live, if this is the path that I am supposed to walk, then I'm going to do it. It's a suffering, but it's what your will is. And I want to do your will. You know, Jesus says to us, take up your cross. Take up your cross and follow me. What on earth? He knows the path because he has already chosen. Jesus already chose that path. He already chose to say, not my will, but thy will be done. And he invites us to put our own will in the hands of God and say, not my will, but thy will be done. Problem with this, this decision that he's asking us to make is that the world, the world, the, 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 the you could say the economy of this world will make every effort to persuade us not to take the path, not to suffer, not to take up our cross. Jesus had to say yes to the cross. Jesus had to say yes to the suffering that he was called to do. Such irony again in in Mark chapter 14, I, I chose this very specifically because, of course, today I'm talking to people who have chosen to come to church. For whatever reason, you chose to come to church today. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you because you somehow believe that by being here today in church, you are going to receive a word from the Lord because you are good church people. And I praise God for that. Here is the word of the Lord. Don't be like the Sanhedrin. And you say, oh, pastor, I, I, I don't want to kill Jesus. Well, answer me this question. When that still small voice came to you this week and said, I want you to go this direction, and you went the other way, were you not like the Sanhedrin? Were you looking for a way to, to quiet that voice down in your life? I know that's how I feel. These are people that know the truth. These are people that saw the truth. And these are people that were sitting in church who rejected the way, the truth, and the life. They trumped up false charges. Reasons like treason against the temple. The created, hear me carefully, the created had now become more important than the creator. My friends, every time that happens, 
It's paganism. It's idolatry. Every time that the created becomes more important than the creator, you can know that you or your church or your people around you that might be involved in the same kind of thinking have slipped maybe knowingly or unknowingly into idolatry. The church structure was more important than the God it was supposed to be pointing to. So saying that he would tear down the temple and in three days build it up, they took him literally. He was talking about his own person. And they thought he was talking about the temple building, which they revered as being holy and sacred. It was more important than the God that it was meant to represent. And he was standing right in front of them and their attitude was, how can we find a way to kill him? And again, I'm not pointing fingers here because I know that I have also not listened. I have also valued the things of this situation I find myself in more than the creator of this situation I find myself in. Interesting that the first angel's message in Revelation 14, 7 is what? Fear God and give glory to him. Which God? The God who made heaven and earth. The creator. It's our message. It's our message, we think, to tell people it's not the created we should be worshiping. It's the creator. It's a very self-same situation that you see here in Mark. People have decided that the temple is more important than the God that it points towards. See, when we choose, like Jesus, to say, not my will, but thy will be done, the way of suffering, you can call it, the way of suffering brings glory to God. Because you could also say that it is the pathway that he chooses for us to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, in the, in, the, in, the, in the talks that I've had with various people this week, I want you to know that this is the very essence of the gospel. This is the very essence of the good news. Jesus came to show us the way back to the Father, to show us the pathway back to a relationship, back to a situation, back to an experience of relationship with God. To walk away from that is to walk away from the life giver. And so it is that, that when Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, that is for everyone. And basically he's saying, those who want life, they're going to get life. Those who don't want life, they're going to get not life. God doesn't want he doesn't want the kind of suffering that is happening in this world today because people are walking step by step away from the life giver. And he calls us who understand this to say, would you please go this week and when you see people who are studiously walking away from the life giver, could you please remind them that there is a God in heaven who loves them, who has given his only begotten son to die for them so that they can come back into a relationship with the life giver. Would you please do that for your friend, your God, your savior, Jesus? 
this week? That's, that's the call of the Holy Spirit on each one of our lives. When he says, this is the way I want you to go. And you say, why do you want to? Well, because I've got somebody for you to meet. Somebody who is struggling. Somebody who needs to hear a word of encouragement from God. Could come from your lips, from my lips, this very week. So what do we see Jesus do? A few days maybe a few hours before we see him before the Sanhedrin, we see him take up the basin and the towel. How is it? How is it that we are to walk this pathway, this suffering? Well, as, as Big Wheel said it in the movie Robots, see a need? Fill a need. Okay, so none of the disciples had decided that it was their job to take off their cloak, to tuck in the towel, and to get the basin, and to wash the other stinky feet of the other 11 disciples. And Jesus. So Jesus takes off his, his cloak, he puts on the towel, he tucks it into his belt, and he kneels down and he starts washing the disciples' feet. So if you want to know, if you want to know how to do this suffering life, if you want to know how to take up your cross, Jesus demonstrates a few hours before he is killed, he demonstrates exactly how we should live. And that is to take up the basin and the towel. So if you don't know, if you didn't know, coming into a communion service here in an Adventist church, we practice foot washing. We're going to do that right now. But this is why we do it. We don't do it so that we can say we did it. We do it so that we can remember that this is how Jesus would like us to act to our fellow human beings on planet Earth. Period. The other neat part about foot washing is that we have the opportunity to pray with each other. I can pray for you. You can pray for me. Now I know that there are some who are like, ew, feet, ew. Yeah, imagine feet with sandals, feet that walked in the streets that weren't paved feet that walked where the donkeys had just pooped. Yeah, those were the feet. And it, that's why it was the servant's job. That's why nobody wanted to do it. And Jesus said, you know what, I'll do it. I'll wash those dirty feet. I'll wash the whole world's feet. And he did, with his own blood. So we, with our, the blood of our lives, can be in service like Jesus and help people to know that there is a life giver who wants them back, who is willing to stoop down and wash their dirty feet, do the things that nobody else really wants to do, but because God says, I want you to do it, you go and do it, and people are amazed that you would be willing to do it, and I don't, I don't know what this means for you, but it might mean, like this week, when I'm at a junction in one of my places that I go very regularly because of taking my wife back and forth to work, and there's a guy in the middle of the junction, in the middle of the cross street, and his car is dead. What are you going to do? Well, I say change history. Get out, make sure he can get across the intersection safely. Because who knows what else could happen to him? Who knows if there's going to be an accident? Step into the situation and wash the feet. I, I don't know what it's going to be for you this week or, or, or even next week, but God is going to ask you if you decide to suffer with Jesus, if you decide to go the pathway that Jesus went, he is going to ask you to do the kinds of things that Jesus did. Touch people with leprosy. Speak to the woman caught in adultery, in a scam that the 
people were using to try and catch Jesus. He says, I don't condemn you. Go and have a good life with God. Don't run away from God, lady. Run towards God. That's what sin and not sin mean, right? Go and sin no more. Stop running away from God. Run towards God. That's what he said. I don't condemn you. Run towards God. He loves you. Is there somebody in your life that you could call this very afternoon, my friends? Call them up and say, you know what? I've been meaning to tell you this, but God loves you. And I love you too. You could change a life. You could save a life today with one phone call. We can do these kinds of things if we're willing to do like Jesus and pick up the basin and the towel Put our, you know, put our pride in our pocket and, 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 and go and, and, and suffer with Jesus. Go the pathway that Jesus went. See, this is where I think suffering takes on a whole new meaning for me. It's like, yeah, bring it on. I'm ready to suffer. If that's what it means to suffer with Jesus, then I'm ready to suffer. See, it's old English. We still think negative thoughts about it. You know, it's like, oh, no, I don't, I don't want to suffer. No, if it means the basin and the towel, and it means doing like Jesus did, that's a positive thing. That's a really great thing. Okay. Do you want to go wash some feet? We've made arrangements to be really modern. If you want to wash your spouse's feet, you can. If you just want to talk to somebody in particular and, and you know you need to this is an opportunity to do that and, and ask for forgiveness and or pray for that person's salvation or have them pray for your salvation this is the time to do that this is the, actually one of my favorite favorite things that we do as a church where we practice what we actually preach which is the priesthood of all believers. So if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you can pray for someone, and the Bible says the prayer of a righteous person availeth much. So if you want that opportunity to pray for somebody right now in the name of Jesus, then don't go get in your car. I know some of you are tempted to do that. You'll miss out on the opportunity of praying for someone. So if you want to pray for somebody, I'm going to invite the, the uh, deacons who are probably already ready and, and, and everybody. Just sit, let's separate. And uh, you don't have to go. There's going to be some nice music played here uh, in the sanctuary. You can sit here and read and contemplate and pray. But uh, I do. I invite you to find somebody who you can pray for in the name of Jesus and, and, and have them receive kind of a mini rebaptism. How'd you like that? You thought only the pastor could baptize. <clears throat> Sorry. You guys get to do it today. You guys get to do it in his name. And he calls you to take up the basin and the towel. Let's do that now. We'll come back here afterwards, yeah?
Welcome back to the Lord's Table. We are being a little, just a little informal and allowing us to come and serve you. Uh, we're going to do that right away. Um, in our baptismal class this morning, the kids were learning from uh, first, is it first Corinthians uh, 11? First Corinthians 11, where Paul is with the people and he's basically teaching them about uh, the, the doing, you could say, of the Lord's Supper. And he gives directives as a pastor to his new congregation in 1 Corinthians and says, in the following directives, uh, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. How, how'd you like that? Eric, this was a, like a slam down on them because what they were doing was getting together and just having way too much food and being too worried about that. He says in verse 23, for what I received from the Lord, I also passed on for you, to you. The Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do you see the, the nice tablecloth that we have says, do this in remembrance of me. This cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So in our Adventist tradition, we try to have communion uh, in this fashion three or four times a year at least whereas there are a lot of other places that have communion every every Sunday and it is a way of remembering it is a way of making sure that we uh, know what Jesus intended not only did he take the basin and the towel but he also brings as emblems of his body bread and we use grape juice, bread and wine, the fruit of the vine. These are symbols as far as we are concerned and they represent what it is that uh, Jesus meant to do. That by him dying, he provided the payment, if you like, or the antidote, if you think of it in terms of medical. He provided the antidote to the sin virus. That we could come and we could say, Lord, I know there's no way that I can ever be righteous in your eyes. But I accept Jesus and his righteousness, his unbroken relationship with the Father. That's what sinlessness means. He can be my substitute. He can be my, uh, do, you, do you want the big word? Propitiation. <laughs> these, are, these are words that, that we just think are so amazing because we don't know what they mean. They simply mean that Jesus took our place. Jesus paid the price. Like the song, Lee, Jesus, Jesus paid it all. He paid it all. Whatever was required in order for us to be able to say with confidence, I am headed to live forever with my Father in heaven. Whatever it takes to, to make that happen, Jesus was willing to do it. And so it is that, that I would like, uh, I'd like to call the, the, the deacons uh, they're, they're at the back. I'd like to call them forward. And uh, we're going to uh, pray together uh, as leaders up here. And then um, I'm going to ask them to uh, serve you uh, these emblems of the Lord's Supper. Uh, just know that later this year when it is Passover time, we're going to do another Passover communion. And that's going to give us opportunity to learn even more about this. So we're going we're gonna to go ahead, gentlemen, let's go ahead and kneel, and I'm going to have first Milt pray uh, for the bread, and if you would pray about the grape juice, the wine. We thank you, God, 
for the bounty of life which you have provided to us through the gift of your son, Jesus, who gave of his life that we might live. We think today of his broken body on the cross and the great suffering that took place in our behalf. And so we're thankful for this grace, the blessedness of his resurrection and the joy of life. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Dear Lord, may this time bring to us remembrance of you and all that you did for us. And may this cup uh, remind us of the blood that you shed for us. Uh, may we never forget. May we always remember. Fill us now in Jesus' name. Chris is gluten-free, so uh, if you are gluten-free as well, just raise your hand and we have someone who uh, will serve you a gluten-free cracker so that you can be part of this as well.
Jesus is uh, at table with his friends. He's not at a high table like this. He's, he's at a low table. And uh, even the scriptures reveal that John, his good friend, probably a younger disciple, is leaning up against him. They're in close proximity with each other. Their feet are out to the side. So it's kind of this wheel of table that you can think of. So it's not like we do this in this Western way. But you can imagine that he takes the bread, the Middle Eastern type bread, he tears off a piece and he hands it to people. And then he hands a cup, probably a communal cup. Uh, we have these very sanitary little plastic things which I have always not liked because there's so little of it. Uh, you know, you always are thinking, man, I'd like a big glass of that. Well, good, I'm glad you like that because the fact is that that's what Jesus is hoping you'll be like. You'll be like, Jesus, whatever you want to give me, I'm ready to take it in. So he said, this is my body. Eat all of it. Take in all that I have to give you as far as nourishment. And then he said, take this cup, follow, follow that food down with the, the juice. You know, that's how it is, right? You need something to wash it down. And he says, this is going to be it. This is going to be how we do this. Let's partake. Really glad that Milton and Denise are teaching the kids. And then there they are, they're they're participating. My mother was kind of a rebel, you know, back in the day. She would pass me her, her cup and I was allowed to take my pinky and stick it in and have a taste. Milt's mother was even more of a rebel. She said, get your own. <laughs> well, in this church, uh, I don't know about your tradition, but we encourage our kids to know Jesus. And we encourage them to know that this is his body and this is his blood and that we celebrate around the Lord's table together as a family because that's what the Passover was all about and thank God Jesus came and his blood causes the death angel the eternal death angel to pass over us all let us bow our heads and thank him our Father in heaven we thank you that in in your mercy you you sent your only son the plan to show us the path. He's the path too. He's, he's everything to us. And because of that, and because of these symbols of his body and his spilt blood on our behalf, we know that the price has been paid, that the, the devil has no ground to stand on in our lives, Jesus. Please chase him away. Keep him away from us. May your Holy Spirit be the, the only voice that we hear May we listen carefully. May we be willing to do what you ask us to do. Because we know that as soon as we go out these doors, there's going to be something that is going to be laid on us to take away the, the joy that we feel right now in being in your presence. Please, Father, give us the courage, like you gave Jesus the courage to go through with what he had to do. Give us the courage to go through with what you would want us to be doing this very next week and into the future. And we will give you all the praise because we are born to praise you. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. amen. And amen.